Six o'clock. Clark and Arickla had just tied for first place on the Wiscombe Park hill climb, but as yet it was no needle match. After one of his leanest years on record, Roger was quietly determined to repeat his first RAC win in 72, even if that meant letting Penty set the pace until the final night. So what's the, what do you think of the RAC so far? Well, it's been wet, generally. Otherwise, um, good fun. How, how bad is this problem of spectators on the special stages? Um, it has been a bit dangerous, yeah. Uh, someone publicised the rally too much, I think. Isn't it infuriating for a top-seated driver like you when the organisers go and cancel two stages that you nearly killed yourself to win? Yeah, it's a bit of a shame, but uh, safety must come uh, first, I would think. You know, it's uh, not much fun to start hurting people. <laughs> In the forest of Greystoke the previous day, it was a miracle no one was hurt. Near to Penrith and the lakes, Greystoke was one of the spectator stages widely advertised in advance, a policy to be reconsidered before the RAC in 77. The stage was well marked, there were plenty of marshals at dangerous points, but the sheer weight of numbers led to cancellation after about 50 competitors had gone through. Opal were having mixed fortunes. Kulang, number 19, was now their one survivor. He'd done well to get within two seconds of Roger Clark at Wiscombe Park. The Eurohandler cadets were serviced by the Pirelli tire bus from Germany, and with only one crew left, they'd plenty of time and food and drink to spare for other competitors. Roger Clark had a quick snack with his new Ford colleague, Valdegard. Outside, the downpour went on and on. I got 60 on the first seven oh, back. Thank you. Thank you. Put it down. Eat when you can. Verini had just tied with Marco Allen on Wiscombe and would go on to win Porlock. An early rally leader had been Hanu Mikola. Most of the bugs on the two-litre Toyota were sorted out, but he would retire with transmission trouble, despite some excellent service. Sausage roll. Come here. Billy Coleman was fourth at the end of the first leg, and after hitting another car which made the handling bad, he still managed to finish sixth, a fine drive. What was Clark's lead now? We're about uh, two minutes at the moment, I think. And how are you going to play it from here on? As well as we can, we've got Wales to go through tonight, and it uh, looks like being a wet night, and anything could happen. In Wales, on the forest stages around Snowdon, Glacynog and the Dovey Valley, Roger Clark made his big effort. Time was running out for the leader, Auricola. When the cars reached the old gold mine in the Coed de Brenin forest, Clark knew that Auricola's exclusion for lateness would probably be upheld. So Blomquist in the Saar was now his nearest rival in the Welsh forests. First, though, there was spectator trouble at Beth Gellert. The organisers cancelled the stage because, they claimed, parked cars had prevented marshals flagging the route in time. Other reasons given to weary drivers like Sandro Minari included faulty course clocks and the need to make up 45 minutes lost through an accident in the night. Either way, thousands of spectators and marshals had arrived at Beth Gellert with hours to spare and feelings ran high. Brian Culture's service crew had changed the gearbox in his TR7 in 52 minutes to keep him in the rally. Clearly, the old Abingdon spirit still lives on. Overall, the Triumph did better than anyone expected. What do you think of all these cancellations, Brian? Well, good for me. I might get to the end now. I hope they cancel the rest of them. Why, do you know where you are? Well, no, I think we're in the top 15 somewhere, but, um, you know, we're only 
just struggling along. What's the problem? Gearbox. Beth Gellert was the sixth special stage to be cancelled, but the decision was particularly harsh on spectators, because with the rally now running in a straight line south, there was no alternative action they could see. Straight on to the next passage control. Was it a problem with the course clocks this morning? No, no. It was um, a problem on the arrowing, actually. Arrowing? Yeah. Why? What couldn't you put them? Well, apparently there's... there's there was too many arrows to put up, and um, there wouldn't have been sufficient time for, before the cars arrived. So with spectators up in arms about the cancellation of stages, and the rally leader Auricola protesting about his exclusion for lateness, the Lombard RAC moved towards its climax among the waterfalls and flooded streams of the Dovey Forest in central Wales. Seven stages still had to be fought out before the finish in Bath that Tuesday night. On Diffie 2, where spectators enjoyed sweeping views of the surviving cars along the whole length of a valley, then for a mile uphill the other side, Pierre Eklund proved the potential of the new Saab 99 EMS. At 10 minutes 42 seconds, he was quicker here than Blomquist, but would retire with a broken gear mox almost in sight of the finish. The Saab factory wanted their new two-litre saloon to do well on its first outing in Britain. They were not disappointed. Ireland's Billy Coleman in the Thomas Motors Escort RS 1800 would have the honour of being the first Escort privateer to reach home. Billy was as quick here as Eklund's Saab, and his final placing at six was a good effort after brake failure, clutch slip, punctures, fuel feed troubles and a great deal of suspension and chassis damage which made the handling unpredictable. seconds faster than Coleman, Bjorn Valdegard on his Ford debut. With only a few hours experience of driving the Escort, he finished third. What would he have done in a Stratus? Sandra Minari, with the world title in his pocket, seemed well content to get his Stratus to the finish unmarked. He took it easy and came fourth. If he'd been trying to win, that would have been something to see. Ulvi Anderson, fifth in the Toyota, fully made up for their failure on the RAC the previous year. The car was reliable, a throttle cable was the only thing to break. But when teammates Mikola and Jean-Luc Terrier retired, all Ulvi's tenacity and experience were needed to bring home the one surviving Toyota. Roger Clark, 10.22 here on Diffie 2, four seconds faster than his rival Auricola. Roger won every remaining test except one, when he was forced onto a wheel rim after a puncture. Roger's performance was better than many people gave him credit for. The early loss from the Ford Works team of Mackinnon and Vattenen left Clark looking vulnerable, and for three days he was two minutes or more behind the fastest man Auricola. His consistency was the key, and his timing of the attack on Penty that final night in Wales was difficult to fault. Mind you, it was a close run thing. Until stage 51 in the West Country, when the BDA engine in Auricola's escort suddenly went flat, Penty had a big enough lead to answer any fast times from Clark. But a broken inlet valve and finally clutch problems put him out four stages from the end. 
had lost the team prize to Saab, but the rally showed that the 131s are highly competitive. As the last cars drove south to Bath through the Welsh mist, the rally year was ending, as it had begun in Monte Carlo, with three men influencing the scene. Italian Sandro Minari, Sweden's Bjorn Valdegard, and Englishman Roger Clark. But as Roger toasted his second RAC victory, the Stuart Pegg, there was a technical hitch. Stig Blomqvist was four minutes behind his old rival Clark, so Saab came second. Valdegard was third, and he found the sudden switch from Stratus to Escort difficult. Stratus is com two completely different cars, so it has been a uh, hard work to, you know, you're working in the wrong way in the beginning, so you work too much maybe. 1976 was a year of surprises on the world rally scene. On the Monte, there was little snow and ice, regulations limited the teams to one kind of tyre, and Pirelli got it right first time with the P7 for Lancia. On the Safari, everyone expected Lancia to sweep the board. Yet after record practice times, Minari and Valdegard were knocked out of this East African classic by suspension and engine failures. By the end of the year, in the forests of Britain, Sandro Minari and his Lancia Stratus were the world title holders once again. When Sandro came back to Bath at the end of the RAC, the crowd gave him a welcome worthy of a world champion. Very, very light car indeed, and uh, far from easy to drive. Is the RAC rally this year any drier for you than last year? Yes, same. <laughs> Much better, sure. But two years ago, I was more uh, happy. Why? Because I, I was third. <laughs> Sandro Minari could afford to be philosophic about coming fourth, for within a few weeks, he'd won the Monte Carlo rally for a fourth time on a Pirelli shot Stratus. Another world championship year was underway.